Good day, everyone. High Road Solution is pleased to present this user group webinar entitled Responsive Design. Our speaker for the presentation today is Lydia Roberts. My name is Jeff Baker, and I will be the moderator for today's seminar. Today's presentation will last approximately 60 minutes and include a specific question and answer period at the end of this session. You may ask a question via the web conference system by simply typing it into the question box on the right-hand side of your screen and then clicking the call-out button or enter on your keypad. These instructions will be repeated later in the program. If you have any technical questions during the event, please email support at highroadsolution.com. Today's webinar is being recorded, and all participant lines will be muted during the live program. Lydia Roberts lends her technical know-how to the High Roads team. Her degree in multimedia arts and sciences provided her with a wide array of artistic and programming skills. She's held positions as an art director, independent developer, and IT support. Lydia currently involves her web programming skills and prides herself on keeping up to date with the latest web breakthroughs and trends, making your website or e-newsletter more efficient, enjoyable, and valuable to your business. And now I'd like to turn the floor over to Lydia. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. I see we have a lot of people joining, so that's great. Um, if you were not able to attend the user group conference, I'm going to be covering uh, basically the same material that I covered on that day. So hopefully this will fill in the gaps for you if you weren't able to attend or you attended but you didn't attend the actual um, coded exercise portion of uh, the presentation. So a lot of you are familiar with the term responsive design. Um, basically, it's a way of designing a website or e-newsletter so that the layout changes based on the screen size that it's viewed upon. So uh, usually the layout will have different areas that will change. Um, sometimes it will have areas that will become hidden depending on what screen size you're viewing it on. So a desktop versus an iPhone, uh, for example. Um, yes, I can speak up a little bit. <laughs> I know a lot of you uh, are using conference calls, so hopefully you can hear me now. Um, so on the left, we have a non-responsive email coming through on an iPhone. And you can see that it's very zoomed out. It's difficult to read. Um, we would have to pinch and zoom in order to really hone in on that email and read it and interact with it. On the right-hand side, we have the same email, but it's been made responsive through something called a media query, which we're going to be covering today. And uh, you can see it, it's so much easier to read, um, and we're going to be able to interact with that a lot better on a mobile device. So any HTML email um, is made up of two parts. The HTML, which is the content, um, which would be the text and images of that email, and the CSS, which is the style. And the style controls how that content gets displayed. Uh, these are the two different components that we're working with. And in the past uh, couple of years, there's actually been a new version of HTML that came out, HTML5, and a new version of CSS, uh, CSS3. And there's a lot of really cool things that came along with CSS3. And one of those new modules is the app media query. And I've written it here with, with the app sign because that's how it's actually written in the code. And the media query rule, um, we're going to take a good hard look at that later on. But it's what makes responsive design possible at all. And unfortunately, the support for the media query rule is not 100% across the board yet. Um, it is supported by pretty much all of the, the newest Android um, iOS devices. Um, however, it, it's not you know 100%. So just keep in mind that as you send out your responsive emails, um, depending on what device you're using and what your members are using, it's not necessarily going to show that mobile view 100% um, of the time because the support just isn't 100% across the board yet. So I'm going to quickly uh, take us through some best practices that 
will hopefully help you as you design your own responsive templates. Um, first off, it's really great if you can keep it to a single column. And we're going to be looking at an example where I've included an area in a template that has two columns. And we'll take a look at that. But in general, keeping the overall layout at one column is going to really simplify things for you um, and just make things a lot more easy, easy to read. Um, we want to keep the key information and call to action at the top of that email. Um, this sort of harkens back to the idea of the above the fold, which a lot of you are familiar with. Um, going all the way back to print, but also to web design and kind of keeping your most important content and information um, at the top of a web page so that it's easily accessible. Um, we also want to keep the content as concise as we can. Um, I know that's kind of difficult to do. Um, and let me just uh, actually stop right here because I see I have a question. Um, basically, to, to explain, we're only going to have one version of our HTML um, for these mobile views. And then the CSS3 uh, will convert uh, two columns down into one column. So we only have one version of HTML, but we're going to be kind of creating these multiple views through the CSS. Um, and we'll take a look at that. Um, so getting back to uh, keeping the content really concise, um, I know this is difficult. Uh, you all have a lot of information that you have to get out to your members. Um, but try to eliminate like table of content areas, which are sort of considered a little bit redundant. Um, try to eliminate long, lengthy articles. And just use short teasers of like a couple sentences with read more links that then go to perhaps a full article on your website. Um, so it, it'll kind of tie into your website in that respect. But it lets people see uh, what they want to read quickly without having to scroll you know, endlessly on the smartphone through a lot of articles. OK, um, we also want to keep the font size at at least 13 pixels in size, um, preferably a little bit larger than that for readability. And in terms of the buttons, um, this is an Apple guideline. Apple recommends a, a target area to the 44 by 44 pixels, um, which is pretty large. Um, that's a pretty chunky button, I would say. Um, I try to keep mine you know, around 40 pixels. And I try to leave space around the button as well so that you're not accidentally clicking on another link um, or something else on the page. And then something that uh, we kind of talked about a couple different times at the user group conference was um, the fact that when people are accessing their mobile device, they're often you know, in sort of a distracting situation. They might be riding in a car or on a train. Um, they might be standing out on a street corner. And the lighting is not going to be uh, very consistent. Um, and also, many people turn down their brightness levels on their phone to kind of like conserve battery. So it's really important to use high contrast colors in your design. And what I mean by that is um, not necessarily the colors themselves, but giving enough contrast between the colors. So if you were going to use a really dark blue, you know, don't use a really dark blue text on a light blue background. Maybe use a white background. Um, so in this example for MOA, we've got it on kind of a light gray background. But it's providing enough contrast so that people you know, in these unknown situations are still going to be able to quickly read on your information. Um, and then lastly, it's, it's so important to test these. And that's something that PyRoad can help you with. Um, but it's really important to note that you know, your organization may use Outlook 
2011, for example, but not all of your members do. So there are so many different email clients out there, and they all kind of have their own little weird quirks um, about how they render things. So it's important that we test across multiple platforms um, and emails and not just the one that your organization uses. Okay, so this brings us to our little case study section. Um, this is a design that I created to kind of mimic what I often see um, from organizations. This is kind of a typical example of um, a conference email. So I've kind of designed this by, you know, by looking at a lot of members' emails and they come to us and say, you know, hey, I want to improve this and I want to make this responsive. So this is sort of our, our starting point right here. And um, I've kind of highlighted some of the problem areas with this existing design. So for one thing, our, our design, and it's difficult to see because this is just a really a mock-up here, but this design is 700 pixels wide, and we really want to keep the desktop view down to 600 pixels. Um, basically, lots of email clients such as AOL, I believe, and Yahoo, they have like a lot of ads and sidebars of their own that come in on the right-hand side of the screen. So if your email is too long, or excuse me, too wide on the desktop, you're not even going to be able to see this information on the right without having to scroll over there. So you can see I've got um, the date of this conference over here on the right, but you know it's probably going to get lost and it's kind of small. Yes, thanks, Jeff, for the pointer. And the uh, also the sidebar, that may also get cut off for those types of email clients. Um, the sidebar is also kind of hard to read, and we can't tell if there are links in there or not because all the text is just one color. Um, so that's kind of confusing. And then the main problem uh, for me that I see is that the call to action is at the bottom. So that's kind of a big no-no because we really need to put that most important information there uh, right at the top. And then just one last thing, um, the uh, social media icons at the bottom are kind of small. So as you can imagine, when this is scaled down for a mobile device, like we saw at the beginning with that American Dental Association email, those are just going to be minuscule. And it's going to be so hard to tap on the one that you want to tap on because they're all going to kind of be on top of each other. OK. So now what I've done here is I've basically reimagined that same template, but with responsive design in mind. So I tried to take all those best practices that we looked at and really think about how I can improve that initial design. So you can see it's, it's actually the whole thing is thinner now. It's actually 600 pixels wide. So it's going to be better for the desktop as well as mobile. Um, the header is easier to read. Um, I basically um, just made this, let's see if I can point there, um, made that larger. Um, the call to action is at the top now, which is good. Um, we've got our register information. And it sounds silly, but the buttons are buttony. They look like real buttons. They look like you can click on them. So it, it sounds kind of funny, but this is really important, especially for mobile, because like I said, people are distracted when they're looking at these devices. And they need to kind of instantly be able to look at it and say, yes, that's a button. I can click on it. I want to register um, without having to give it any thought. Um, then what I've done is I moved those key details into two columns so that they're all kind of visible at, at once um, and just kind of delineated it a little bit better. 
And I also made the icons a lot larger and added a share button, which is a feature that um, we offer at High Road. So people can actually share this uh, with their own social media platforms. So this would basically be our final result. And on the left is our, would be our desktop view, which we were just looking at. And the right is going to be our mobile view once we um, take it through and add the responsive code, which is what we're going to do next. So uh, like I said before, we're just going to have the one version of HTML, but we're creating these two different views from that HTML. So through the CSS, through the media queries, we're going to write some special rules that are going to inform the HTML about how to change for that mobile view. Um, one thing to point out, and a lot of you have asked me this, is you know, could I have a tablet version? Could I have you know, multiple tablet versions? And yes, you could. Um, you could write as many media queries as you wish, and you could create as many different views as you wish. Um, but the reason that at High Road why we only do the two versions is because pretty much any tablet, um, you're going to be covered in terms of the desktop view. So that desktop view is going to be just fine for basically any tablet um, if you set your desktop view at 600 pixels. So that's another reason for keeping your desktop view um, on the narrower side. Um, and then any smartphone is going to be able to view the mobile view. So it's really just more work and more time to create those extra tablet views. And it's really, to me, it's unnecessary. But you certainly could do that. That's a possibility. OK, so um, this is important. Before you code, um, obviously you want some kind of design to start out with. And that's going to help you because you want to be able to look at that design and kind of think through what you want to happen for that mobile view. And that's what we're going to do right now. Um, we're going to take a look at this design and go through it piece by piece and say, OK, this is what we want to happen for that mobile version or mobile view. So first of all, um, we're starting out with that 600 pixel design. And we want to take it down to 300 pixels. Um, this is what I recommend. I recommend going down to 300 pixels and then having about 10 pixels on either side of the design for padding. So you're going to end up with 320 pixels total. And I came up with that number because most uh, phones are going to be able to view that. You have to go back, way back, to um, some pretty old phones that have really tiny screens um, that would actually have to scroll side to side. So any, like, any modern phone is going to be able to view this. Um, it, if you set it to 320. So it's just a really good standard size. So going along with that, since we're actually resizing the whole email, uh, taking it down to 300 pixels, we can't forget to scale our images down. So we've got two full width images that are 600 pixels wide right now. And we need to scale those down to 300. So I've highlighted that here. Um, here we go. Got our header graphic and our footer graphic, which is kind of a little bit subtle, so it's a little hard to see there. Um, then here are our column areas that I was pointing out. So uh, you may not have been able to tell, but this area down here with the buttons, these are actually two columns as well. So all we've got four columns going on. And all these columns are going to need to stack on top of each other, because there's really just not enough space to maintain those columns with a 300 pixel width. 
Um, then we've got some footer links, and this is kind of a, a detail thing that we like to do, where we like to take these little links and stack them on top of each other so that they're easier to click on. And then these little pipes or divider lines in between the links, we're going to get rid of those. We're just going to hide them for the mobile view. OK, so how do we do this? Um, how do we actually identify in the code what areas of the template we want to change? And I see that, um, oops, sorry, I thought I had another question. Uh, let me just read our question here. I'll come back to that at the end. Um, sorry for the break there. Um, I just want to get through this part about targeting our, our template. So what we can do is um, target our, our cells. You can also target images, any kind of tag that you have going on in your template, in your HTML. You can target with IDs and classes. And I've identified here the IDs in this specific HTML, um, which, by the way, we will provide to you. Um, after this webinar, you'll have all these files. So you can kind of break it down yourself and go through. Um, headers, or excuse me, IDs can only be used once. So you want to use them for unique elements in your template. And like I said, here I'm applying it to the table cell. So it would be TD ID equals header, or TD ID equals social. So the other way we can do this is by targeting with classes. And classes are similar to IDs, except we can use them multiple times. So you're going to uh, sort of reserve classes for similar elements in your template. So here I've used them for the columns, because we've got four of them, and we want them all to do the same thing. And I'm also applying a class of table to the overall table that we're going to scale down to 300 pixels. Um, just in case I were to add another table at some point, I could add that same class to it, and it would scale down to 300 pixels. Um, this is something that a lot of you may not be aware of, um, even if you've coded your own templates before. Um, this was something that I learned when I started coding templates from scratch. Um, you can use a transparent GIF um, or GIF. And I usually call it spacer.gif. And it's basically a one pixel transparent GIF that you can use anywhere throughout your template. And you can use it to basically force width throughout your template. Um, so for example, if I wanted some padding um, at the very top of my template, maybe between that pre-header text and the header. So this little gap in here. If I wanted to make sure that that was always 20 pixels and no more, no less, I could put a spacer gif there with the height of 20 pixels. And every single email client would be able to recognize that. This is sort of the trump card for forcing width um, throughout any email client. Because like I said, there are so many email clients out there. They all have quirks about how they render things. Um, and images is one thing that they kind of can't escape. So using a, a spacer GIF is a really good, great way of doing this. And I've used one down here. I'm actually using them in other places in the template as well. But this is one that is crucial to what we're doing because I think it's set to a width of maybe 560 pixels or so. So what's going to happen is if we don't scale this spacer just down for mobile view, um, it's going to break the template because this is still really wide, so it's going to force the template to stay that width. Um, so that's why I'm pointing it out here. 
and we're going to change it in the media query here in a second. So I've given this an ID of body width so that we can identify it later. All right. Um, and then one last thing to, to point out, because this is really useful as well, um, is eliminating unwanted areas of your template for mobile. Um, so basically, we can hide any element that we wish. And I've got here, in my little arrow, some areas in white. And these are all the areas that I just want to completely hide. I want to get rid of this spacing for the mobile view, because it's going to look a lot better um, without these gaps on the sides to give it a little bit more space for the text. And like I said, I wanted to hide those divider lines in between the text. So I'm going to give these all a class of hide. And then inside of our media query, we are going to define that class so that it actually means something and gets applied to this template. So one thing to point out here is that you can hide as many elements as you choose for the mobile view, but I don't recommend hiding actual content. Um, I just recommend kind of using this for layout or aesthetic purposes. Because when you start hiding content, you're sort of giving the mobile viewers a different experience, and they're not getting all the same information that you're getting on the desktop view. So that's why I don't really recommend you know, like we could just hide these columns if we really wanted to, but why would we do that? You know, let's give everybody the same information. Um, and that's something, I, I point that out because that's something that happens with responsive web design a lot, is certain things are just kind of hidden for a mobile view. Um, and let me stop right here and, and answer the question that had come in before. Um, and basically, uh, she was asking about sort of how, do we have to purchase anything, um, like upgrade to CSS3 um, in order to see this happen. And really, CSS3 and HTML5 are actually already like in effect, um, so to speak not every single module or rule of CSS3 and HTML5 is um, supported by all browsers or email clients. So that's kind of what I was saying, where the at media rule is pretty much supported um, by every browser except for Internet Explorer 8 um, and lower. So Internet Explorer 7 and 8 does not support this. Um, some of the older phones do not support this. But this isn't something that you have to purchase in order to see. It's just sort of in effect out there on the web, um, kind of taking place behind the scenes. So this brings us to really the code heavy portion of this webinar. Um, we're going to go through seven steps. And it's the seven things that we identified earlier on as the things that we wanted to change about our template for the mobile view. So um, first of all, we have to define our media query. So the media query goes in the head of your document, of your HTML document, goes in the head, it goes inside of your styles, so inside of your style sheet, kind of along with your other styles. But note the syntax here of, get my pointer back if I can. We've got an opening bracket here. Then this is um, some commented out text. This is where our styles are going to be. And then we have our closing bracket. So if you forget this closing bracket at the end, um, it will not work. And I've definitely done that before. Um, so always check that. Um, just make sure you don't have a typo anywhere. 
So first we've got to set our max width. And basically what this means, this max width 480, this is saying that any screen 480 pixels or smaller will display all the files that we're going to put inside of the media query. So you could change this number. Um, and this is where I was saying that you could create a bunch of different views if you wanted to. So you could have max width 480, closing bracket. Then you could create another media query down here of uh, max width you know, 680 or 650 or whatever you wanted. Um, you can have as many of these media queries as you wish. But like I said, usually just the one um, is going to be just fine. And moving on to our, here's our first rule. And this is uh, making that class of table that we talked about before. We're taking it down to a width of 300 pixels. Now, those of you that are um, familiar with CSS or have worked maybe more in, uh, in the web design field, not so much with email, will probably notice that this syntax is a little bit funny. It's a little different. Um, instead of saying dot table, that's really all you would need for, for a website. You would say dot table and then width 300 pixels. Um, we have to write it in this kind of funny way with the brackets because of a bug with Yahoo Mail. So this takes us back to um, kind of the quirks that I was talking about before. Um, these email clients render things very differently than browsers. So the way that your email looks in Firefox does not necessarily reflect how it's going to look in Gmail, for example, um, or AOL Mail, or Thunderbird. Um, it, they're very different, and they're very particular. So the bug actually goes back to, um, uh, well, the actual issue would be if you did not include this in your syntax, it would actually um, display the mobile version for people viewing it on a desktop. So that's pretty bizarre when they get an email in their, their inbox, and um, it's showing you know this 300 pixel skinny design. So that's why we have to write it that way. Um, and I had a question about our quotes needed in media queries. I've gotten it to work without the quotes. So if you're talking about the quotes right here around the word table, um, no, I don't think those are absolutely necessary. Um, that's just kind of, this is sort of standard syntax to have the quotes here. Um, and if you've tested it across, you know, many different email clients and it looks fine, then great, like you're good to go. Um, I would say you don't need the quotes there, um, but that's just sort of standard syntax to have the quotes. Um, and then I got another question about, is it safe to put media queries in the head tag? Shouldn't the styles go within the body tag? Um, and this question is, I think you're, you're referring to the fact that sometimes styles within the head tag are stripped out, um, and so they're not viewed. And basically what happens is media queries um, only need to be read by those devices, so like the smartphones, that's what we're aiming for. And the smartphones, the way that they render emails are, is a lot smarter than the way that desktop clients render it. So the code, that those media queries, if you put them in the head, they're not going to be stripped out for the smartphones. So they'll still be able to see all of this information and they will display the mobile view. Um, in general, you can put styles in the body if you're concerned about them getting stripped out. Um, but you know, if you're sending 
through High Road, which I'm assuming you are, um, we do tons of testing with all of your templates. And this is how I code all of our designs now, and they're all within the head. And it's all making it through to those smartphones. So you're good to go there. Um, let's see, I think we had a couple other questions. Um, are there other email systems that require particular coding of the CSS? Um, other email systems that require particular coding? Um, not per se. This is this is the big one right here. The way of formatting your your selectors um, for Yahoo Mail. That's that's kind of the big one. Um, but there are a lot of other quirks that do happen with email templates um, that require specific fixes throughout the style sheet, um, which I'm not going to go into because that's a whole other can of worms. But um, in terms of what we're talking about today with responsive design, this is pretty much it right here. Um, the other thing to point out um, on this slide is that we have to use important after every single rule, or actually within every single rule. Um, and this is because when we code these email templates, we are um, including a lot of inline styles throughout the template. So when we're trying to create the mobile version, we've got to overwrite or override, excuse me, our own styles. So you've got to have this in there. You have to have important after every single rule. Um, that's just a good rule of thumb. Um, and that's hopefully that answers the question that came in about why are we using this. Um, so again, to reiterate, uh, email client rendering of, of HTML is very different than a browser's rendering. So things that make sense to you um, from a browser perspective, like it's kind of considered bad practice to use important um, after your rules in CSS unless you just absolutely have to. I mean, it's kind of a last resort type of a thing. But what I'm telling you is that for this, it's a standard. Like this is the standard syntax of what we have to do. So I, I promise that the web gods are not going to come down and smite you for you know, using this crazy syntax, because this is just what we have to do for email clients. Um, and yes, you will still need inline formatting for desktop. That was another question that came through. Do we still need inline styles, the inline formatting for the desktop clients? And the answer is a resounding yes. Um, you want to do all of your styling basically in line, except for the media query. Um, if you're building out an HTML email and you've got the whole thing styled through a style sheet, it's not going to work. Um, I guarantee you it's not going to work because for one thing, Gmail will strip out. They just automatically ignore all those styles in the head. So you've got to use inline styling. OK, um, let's move on, because we do have quite a bit to go through. And I might have to kind of skip through a little bit. Um, but you guys asked some great questions. So keep those coming if you have questions. So the next thing we've got to do is resize that spacer GIF. And I'm not really going to take you through this in such detail, but I do have on the left how I came up with this number. And once you're actually able to, to view my file, you'll be able to look at that. But this basically harkens back to what I was saying um, with those spacer GIFs, that we have to remember to um, size those spacer GIFs down, because if, if they remain too wide, then our template isn't going to resize properly. And just, just to point this out, because someone asked this at the user group, um, just my syntax on this 
slide. I've got a little dot, dot, dot. Um, obviously, you're not going to write dot, dot, dot in your code. That's just kind of to indicate that we're continuing on um, with our rules. And all of our rules are just you know one after the other um, inside of this media query. So just ignore that. OK. So now what we're going to do is resize the image inside of the table cell for the header and footer. So you can see that I've got, losing my little arrow there, um, we've got selecting the, the table data cell, the TD, but then after it, we've written image, which will target the image inside of the TD with the ID of header and the TD with the ID of footer. So basically what this is going to do is it's going to automatically resize that um, header and footer image to the width of its container. And the width of its container is the table, which is now 300 pixels wide. So we don't actually have to put in actual pixels here. We don't have to calculate that. We just need to say, you know, take up the full width, 100% width of that container. Um, and then another question was, do we have to write this code ourselves, or will it be written by, by, by a program? So like, you know, perhaps your hybrid account. Um, unfortunately, there is not a, a magic button or solution for creating these responsive templates. And it has to be coded by a person somewhere. So, you know, whether you all have High Road um, work with you on this and we code it for you, or if you want to, you know, code it yourselves and have us do testing, um, you know, and work with you on it. All of those things are a possibility, but there's not an automatic solution for converting a template from a non-responsive template to be a responsive template. Um, that does not exist yet, although I'm sure in the future we'll probably see some of those solutions. OK, so um, moving on, and i got to kind of run through these quickly. We are adding our class of hide so that we can um, basically hide elements for that mobile view. So we're going to use good old display none, um, which is just the same as it would be in web design. Now we're going to stack those two columns. Or actually, we've got four columns going on. We're going to stack those columns on top of each other. So on our class and column, we're going to give it a width of 100%. So instead of taking up uh, you know, only 50% of the page, like it did before when we had two columns, we are taking up 100% width. And the display block uh, may not actually be necessary for most devices, but I have found it's necessary for Firefox. Um, that's that's just me testing templates. If you don't put display block, it will still show the columns side by side. So someone viewing it on a browser um, from their phone, viewing, viewing it in Firefox, you're going to need to put this in there. Um, now we're going to just change. This is really small stuff. We're going to change some alignment um, of our social media icons, because they were on the right. And we're going to align them to the left. And then we're going to give them a little bit of space on top so that they're not, not right up under that share button that we created. Um, and then here's kind of our little detail thing is we're going to target the links inside of the footer area. So we've got an ID of footer links on our uh, table cell. But then we're using A, just like we used image, IMG, before to target an image, we're using A to target the links within this table cell. 
So we can get really fine-tuned about what we target. And we're going to use display block again and give it a margin on the bottom just to create some spacing. So here is our completed media query. Um, this will be obviously provided to you all um, through this slide deck and also through my actual files that I've created. And I kind of highlighted in red that that hanging, you know, closing bracket um, is important there. Okay. Um, so here is our mobile view, you guys. Um, this is what it should look like on a mobile device now if everything was put in place correctly. So that mobile view is, is now going to show. Um, we talked a little bit about testing. And these are sort of like the first line of defense testing. This is how I um, develop. I first of all use my browser. Um, I, I did say that the browser is not a good indication of how things will render, but it is a great indication of how the media queries will render. Because like I said, the smartphones are smarter, like they're better at reading CSS than, um, than email clients on the desktop are. So it's a great way of testing to make sure that your media queries are correct. And I'm actually going to show you really quick how I do this um, on my own desktop. And it's very easy to do. Um, you basically are going to resize your browser window. Um, you're going to pull the corner of your browser window and make it smaller. Um, so let me try to share my screen real quick and show you how I do that. Just uh, hang with me for a second here. Okay, so hopefully you all can, can see my screen here. Um, this is our email as, you know, viewed in Firefox. Okay, so if I take the bottom right-hand corner of this, and I just start pulling it down. At some point, um, at, at that break point of 480 pixels, it's going to switch to my mobile view if I've got all my media queries in there correct. So this really is my mobile view. Um, you can see these links are stacked on top of each other now. Um, our icons are on the left. Our columns are stacked. And voila, it works. Um, another thing you can do in Firefox, which is really cool, is you can go to Tools, Web Developer, Responsive Design View. The Tools, Web Developer, Responsive Design View. If you click on that, it gives you like a window to do this in. And it also gives you specific sizes. So here's that 320 size that I was talking about. 320 is kind of like a smaller smartphone. So you can see this is kind of the actual view, like this is the fold, so to speak. Um, so we can see our all of our important information there is like above the fold. Um, and there's a bunch of different sizes that you can select. So that's pretty cool. All right. So go back to the slide. There's also another tool called CyberCrab. If you Google CyberCrab, um, they have a, a screen, screen test. I think it's called screen test. 
um, tool that they provide, um, which will give you a bunch of those different sizes. Sorry, folks. Trying to get back to my my slides here. Um, one really good question that um, I, I think maybe I missed this before was a question about fonts, and someone asked about um, is defining fonts using ends. Uh, or ENs uh, better than using pixels or the PX that we're using here. Um, you can definitely use ENs. And ENs are really recommended for responsive web design for sure. Um, if you're doing this for a website, you should be using ENs. Um, I tend to use pixels or emails because of the limitations that we get from all these email clients. Um, I sort of explain to people that email clients, email clients are just dumb. Like their rendering engines are dumb. Whereas the web page browsers are so much smarter at the things that they can understand. So when you code uh, an email, you're kind of having to think backwards. You're sort of thinking in this 1995 way of coding. And so I try to keep everything really fixed in terms of pixel width and pixel sizes for fonts because it just tends to render so much better. And I don't know at what point, you know, Outlook 2014 might decide that they don't recognize ends because they're constantly changing their the way that they render things. And it's just very unpredictable. And um, that's why I keep it to pixels. Um, and then another uh, person asked about the code to get the columns to stack on top of each other. There is some specific code that you need included in your HTML. So you need an inline style in order to get that to function properly for Outlook. Um, if you don't include a specific uh, portion of code, Outlook will uh, stack the columns on top of each other for the desktop view. It will actually kind of display the mobile view on the desktop, uh, which is really weird. So when I send you all the, the code files for this, you'll see that. Um, go to the column area, and you'll actually see there's a style um, that I've included there. And there's some really funky code in there um, specifically targeting Outlook. So. Um, take a look at that. Um, and then we're, we're kind of almost out of time here, but some other tools to use are the built-in web developer tools inside of Chrome and Firefox uh, browsers. Um, so I use Firebug for Firefox, um, but there are actually built-in developer tools on both of those browsers that you can look into. And then in terms of, uh, in terms of testing, um, we use, at, at Hybrid, we use a service called Litmus. And it's amazing because it tests all the major email clients and a lot of the apps now, the mobile apps. And it actually gives us a screenshot of what your email would look like um, in those different settings. Um, and it's very accurate. So this is really the best way um, because no one has, you know, no one wants to create 50 different email accounts on all these different email clients and install a bunch of software and buy a bunch of smartphones. Um, it's just crazy. So that's why we use this uh, Litmus service, um, which we can pr provide you all with as well. Um, okay. So, and then I'm just kind of looking over some questions. Um, make sure I didn't miss anything here. Um, and uh, again, so this again, this is kind of a manual process for now. Um, an actual human being has to go into your email and convert it to be responsive 
if it's not set up already. Um, so on, on the left, we've got our before uh, image. And you can see that even the before image, before we made it responsive, it's pretty bad, but it's not terrible because you know, the buttons are still kind of readable. Like, we still designed it with responsive design in mind. So, like, it's better than what it would have been if we hadn't, you know, done that step. But obviously, the after view is a lot better. This is our responsive view. So, um, these links are kind of in a funky color, but these are all resources that I've um, used as I've been working on these, and um, they will be provided to you um, at the end, like I said, so you'll be able to click on these and actually um, do some further reading. So um, that pretty much wraps it up. I had one more thing I just wanted to address, um, you know, going back to setting up those IDs and classes at the beginning where we went through and kind of labeled each part of our design um, using those IDs and classes. That is something that you do not have to do ever again once you create the template initially. So all of the things that we just went through, we're now done and this template is complete. It would be loaded into your Hyroid account. You would be able to add content, um, change out pictures, and you would never have to touch that code again. So, you know, it's a lot of work up front, but then your template is set. So um, that was that. And then the only other thing to be aware of is that it is possible to break the responsiveness of a template if parts of that template are deleted. So if I were to, you know, just start deleting tables and rows and um, some of the overall layout elements, it, it may no longer work. And we're actually going to write an article. Um, Erica Pirate is going to write an article about that, um, and we'll give you guys some pointers on how to kind of make sure that that doesn't happen. So um, that about wraps it up. I don't see any other questions coming through, and we're right at about an hour. So um, let's see. I do see one more question. All styles should be in the head of the template. So is it bad to use external styles? Um, yes, that's bad. Um, we need to keep all the styles within that one HTML page. So all your styles need to go in the head. Um, like I said, you don't want to use styles to control the layout so much in an HTML template. You want to use inline styles. So it's okay to use styles all over the place, but they need to be inline. So they need to be in the actual HTML, um, not, not in the head, because like I said, those will get ignored. Um, and we cannot include external links to style sheets or JavaScript. Um, that just isn't allowed with email. So um, thank you guys so much. I hope that answered a lot of your questions. If you still have questions, you can contact us. Um, and yeah, I'm going to hand it back over to, to Jeff. And it looks like you guys have a short survey that you can fill out as well um, to give us some feedback. So thank you, guys. Great. Thank you, Lydia. And thank you, everyone, for your participation in today's webinar, Responsive Design, brought to you by High Road Solution. Um, there is, as Lydia mentioned, the survey link right there uh, on your screen. So if you would take just a couple of minutes and fill that out, it would be much appreciated. Um, we will have access to uh, a lot of the information that Lydia did discuss today, as well as an archive uh, of this webinar. And that will be emailed out to you in the next couple of days. Thank you again for your time, and everyone may now disconnect.